Welcome. I'm Gregory Mansfield, the rector here at the Episcopal Church of St. Bernard de Claveaux, worshiping in the ancient Spanish monastery. We're glad you're joining us for worship this morning. I'm standing here in the chapel in front of our Spanish processional cross and our torches. Processional crosses have been used since ancient times to lead processions into the church and also processions out of the church and into the world. On rogation days around harvest, at other times of the year, processions went through the streets and the alleys of towns, villages, and cities. This was a way to collect people as the parade passed by their homes and businesses to join in and to follow in the procession into the church. And you can certainly see that if you had gone down a street and turned, if the streets were crowded, you might not be sure where to go. But if you looked up and kept your eyes on the cross, you would be able to know the right way to go. Here in our chapel of St. Bernard, we often do processions on Sundays. Our verger, Leotine Allen, leads our acolytes, sometimes with an incense pot, with a person that is called the thurifer, using the smoke to light the way, and then somebody carrying the cross, called a crucifer, carries the cross in procession, sometimes with four torches. The torch bearers carry four, symbolic of taking the light of Christ to the four corners of the world. There are many of our hymns, like Lift High the Cross, that remind us that part of our duty as Christian peoples is to exalt Christ crucified and to keep our eyes on the cross. This morning, we'll be singing Rise Ye Pure in Heart, and we will be singing about Lift Your Standard High, Let Your Banners Go Forth as we worship. So you join us this morning in our chapel here at the Monastery Church of St. Bernard. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your grace may always precede and follow us, that we may continually be given to good works. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lectura del Libro del Éxodo del Antiguo Testamento, capítulo 32. Cuando el pueblo vio que Moisés se demoraba en bajar del monte, el pueblo se reunió alrededor de Aarón y le dijo, Ven, haznos dioses que vayan delante de nosotros. En cuanto a este Moisés, 
el hombre que nos sacó de la tierra de Egipto, no sabemos qué ha sido de él. Aarón les dijo, quiten los anillos de oro que están en las orejas de sus mujeres, sus hijos y sus hijas y tráiganmelo. Entonces todo el pueblo se quitó los anillos de oro de sus orejas y se los trajeron a Aarón. Él tomó el oro de ellos, los formó en un molde y fundió una imagen de un becerro y dijeron, estos son tus dioses, oh Israel, que te sacaron de la tierra de Egipto. Cuando Aarón vio esto, construyó un altar delante de él y Aarón hizo una proclamación y dijo, mañana será fiesta para el Señor. Se levantaron temprano, al día siguiente ofrecieron holocaustos y trajeron sacrificios de bienestar. Y al pueblo se sentó a comer y beber y se levantó para divertirse. El Señor le dijo a Moisés, desciende ahora mismo. Tu pueblo, a quien sacaste de la tierra de Egipto, ha obrado perversamente. Se han apresurado a desviarse del camino que les ordené. Se han moldeado una imagen de un becerro y lo han adorado. Y le han ofrecido sacrificios y han dicho, estos son tus dioses, oh Israel, que te sacaron de la tierra de Egipto. Dijo el Señor a Moisés, he visto a esta gente lo testarudos que son. Ahora déjame para que mi ira se encienda contra ellos y los consuma, y de ti haré una gran nación. Pero Moisés imploró al Señor, su Dios, y dijo, oh Señor, ¿por qué se enciende tu ira contra tu pueblo, a quien sacaste de la tierra de Egipto con gran poder y mano fuerte? ¿Por qué habría de decir los egipcios? Fue con mala intención que los sacó para matarlos en las montañas y consumirlos de la faz de la tierra. Vuélvete del ardor de tu ira, cambia de opinión y no traigas desastre a tu pueblo. Recuerda a Abraham, Isaac e Israel, tus siervos, como les juraste por tú mismo diciéndoles, multiplicaré tu descendencia como las estrellas del cielo y toda esta tierra que te he prometido te la daré y la heredarán para siempre. Y el Señor cambió de opinión sobre el desastre que él planeaba traer a su pueblo. La palabra del Señor. Salmos 106. Aleluya. De gracias al Señor, porque Él es bom, pues su misericordia dura para siempre. ¿Quién puede, quién puede declarar los actos poderosos del Señor? o mostrar todos sus elogios. Felices los que agen con justicia, y siempre hacen lo que es cierto. Lémbrate de mí, Señor, como favor que tienes para como o teu povo. Y visíteme como su ayuda salvadora, para que yo pueda ver la prosperidad de sus eleitos y alegrese con la alegría de su povo para que yo pueda me gloriar con su herencia. Pecamos como nuestros antepasados pecaron. Fizemos cosas erradas y agimos mal. Israel fez un becerro en Urebe y adoró una imagen fundida. Y así, ellos trocaron su gloria para la imagen de un boi que se alimenta de capim. Ellos se quisieron de Dios, su Salvador que tenía hecho grandes cosas en Egipto. Maravillosas acciones en la tierra de Cam y cosas terribles en el mar vermelho. Entonces, él sería destruido si no tuviese Moisés, su escolhido, se colocado delante de él en la brecha para desviar su ira de consumirlos. Gloria al Padre, al Filho y al Espíritu Santo, como era no inicio, é agora, e será para sempre. Uma leitura do Novo Testamento, de la Carta a los Filipenses, capítulo 4. Mis hermanos e hermanas, a quienes amo e anhelo, gozo e corona mía, estad firmes en el Señor de esta maneira, amados míos. Insto a Eudia y exhorto a Sintique a ser de la misma opinión en el Señor. Si 
Y te pido también a ti, mi fiel compañera, que ayudes a estas mujeres porque ellas han luchado junto a mí en la obra del Evangelio, junto con Clemente y el resto de mis colaboradores, cuyos nombres están en el libro de la vida. Regocíjense en el Señor siempre. De nuevo diré, alégrate, que todos conozcan tu dulzura. El Señor está cerca. No se preocupen por nada, pero en todo por medio de la oración y la súplica con acción de gracias, den a conocer sus peticiones a Dios. Y la paz de Dios, que sobrepasa todo entendimiento, guardará sus corazones y sus mentes en Cristo Jesús. Finalmente, amados, todo lo que es verdadero, todo lo que es honorable, todo lo que es justo, todo lo puro, todo lo que es agradable, todo lo que es encomiable, si hay alguna excelencia y si hay algo digno de alabanza, piensen en estas cosas. Sigue haciendo las cosas que has aprendido, recibido, oído y visto en mí. Y el Dios de paz estará contigo. La palabra del Señor. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according 
to Matthew. Once more, Jesus spoke to the people in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. And then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. So go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. And then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Holy and Undivided Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If you're just joining us for the first time, we're in the middle of a sermon series through our Old Testament lectionary. We started out with the story of Abraham and the covenant. We went to Isaac and Jacob, and then the story of Joseph. We also have looked at the stories of the wives of Sarah, Rachel, Leah, and Hagar. And now we have started the story of Moses. In the last couple of weeks, we have started out with Moses in the bulrushes, with a calling of Moses, and now we're in the midst of the story of the Exodus. And the Bible tells us in Exodus that it had been 40 days and 40 nights since Moses had left the people to go up to that mountain to bring down the commandments and the covenant of God. And Moses being gone these 40 days and nights created an atmosphere of fear and impatience. And in this situation, we need to look at what's behind the idol worship that we have in this morning's story. You see, the people had happened on hard times before this. They'd gotten themselves out into the desert and crossed the Red Sea. They'd run out of water and food, and they'd complained. And this is the first instance that something happened that was so significant that they turned their attention to worshiping another god. Now Moses had been gone for far too long and fear had overtaken the people. Their faith began to wane and God's presence seemed so withdrawn from them. And in response to this situation, they turned their attachment to something else. Now, maybe you felt that way, where God's presence was gone, and no matter how hard you reach for it, you couldn't find it. And when you have, have you been felt tempted to turn to something else other than God? If so, you're like me and guilty of idolatry. When times of stress or fear or boredom or even crisis come, and God seems far away, what is it that we turn to? What are the things we reach for? Because the truth about you and the truth about me is that we all have a golden calf. You and I have an idol. And some of us, if we're absolutely honest, we have a whole barn full of calves and idols. But we as Christians, we know that Christians aren't supposed to have idols. 
We're not supposed to have golden calves. So we hide them, paint them a different color, and try to hide them. While it's true that we don't make graven images, we don't bow down to these things, nevertheless, we fashion idols out of money, cars, houses, and pleasure. We worship our humanity. And the story of the golden calf is found in this morning's story in Exodus chapter 32. This is a story from 3,300 years ago. The children of Israel had been in bondage for 200 years. Now God calls Moses the deliverer and told Moses that he had heard the cries of his people and he was about to deliver them. And during their time in Egypt, the Israelites had apparently begun to doubt the very existence of God. They doubted the God that their ancestors had worshipped because we've learned that Moses had some hard questions for them. Remember when he was in conversation with God? Moses asked, well, if the people ask me who has sent me, what shall I tell them your name is? You see, that's how far distant their relationship with God had become. And so to help Moses prove the existence and the power of God, Moses was given some miraculous signs to perform before the Israelites. And after all these miracles were done, including the 10 plagues on the Egyptians, the Israelites came out of Egypt with a renewed belief in the God of their ancestors. Now, if we can just put ourselves into the mindset of the ancient Israelites at that time. I mean, first there is the story of the Passover, where the children of Israel were told to sacrifice a young lamb and then to take the blood of that animal and to smear it on the lintels, the doorpost over their house, because the angel of the Lord was going to kill the firstborn of all of those in Egypt. And so you could imagine people who were superstitious, perhaps, but not really believers in this God that they had no relationship with, but they see all of the people sacrificing and they're putting blood on their doors and they're told you have to do this or the angel of the Lord will take your firstborn. Well, you might as well chance it and say, well, at least I'll try that. I mean, if nothing happens, nothing happens, but you don't wanna be the only one that didn't do that. And of course, what happens is the angel of the Lord does pass over all of those homes. And the next morning, the Bible tells us there was all of this weeping and gnashing and teeth, and they could hear the wailings of mothers over their children. And of course, we learned that even the firstborn of the animals also lay dead. So you could imagine just the power and the impact of such a story. You would, if you weren't a believer before then, you'd be, so glad we did that, and you would have some fear of this God who had that power over life and death. And then, of course, we go through the story of all of the plagues, the frogs, the locusts, the Nile being turned into blood. And people began to see with those plagues of flies and other things the power of the living God. And each one of those, of course, builds in succession. So we have all of these uh, great stories and they pass through the Red Sea onto dry land as they're making their escape from Egypt. And we learn that the, the, the river comes back together over the Red Sea and all those waters kill all the Egyptians and carry them away with their chariots. So as they look back and to see this amazing scene, they know something of the power of this God and this has helped solidify them. But we get through that story and then they get out into the wilderness and now they're thirsty and now they're hungry. And of course they begin complaining and we've read the last couple of weeks how of course quail came and they were given meat and how God provided the manna, the bread from heaven. But now Moses has been gone and now people are beginning to have their doubts again, especially as weeks turn into a month or more. Now, we know that when God gave his laws to the Israelites, he began by addressing religious pluralism. 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from a time in bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. You shall not make for yourselves any graven images or the likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them and worship or serve them for I am the Lord your God. Now, when Moses is up on the mountain receiving the laws and the covenant of God, the people down on the plain were getting anxious. The Bible tells us that Moses spent 40 days. Now, as we've talked a lot about the numerology of the Bible for 12, for 40, um, all of these numbers have a great amount of significance, but what we know is it means a long time. It means more than a month. And by the end of that time, the people were beginning to think that Moses had abandoned them, or perhaps he had even died. And the people urged Aaron, who was their temporary leader, to make them gods to follow. And since these people were used to visual representations of deities, which was the common thing in Egypt, this was a natural result of all of their thinking. And so they brought their gold rings, their chains, and their earrings made of gold, and they melted them down so that they could have a god. Now, the idol that was crafted was a calf. Now, Aaron maintained the name of the Lord with it, and I think that's something that we tend to overlook when we're reading the story in the Bible, that he connected Yahweh, the God who had delivered them, with this calf. He was merging the pagan practices that were all around the Israelites at that time with the worship of the God that they were just getting reacquainted with having been in slavery for 200 years. So Aaron called the people together and he told them that the golden calf was in fact the God who had delivered them from Egypt. And the people offered sacrifices and then they engaged in pagan rituals and the Bible tells us even orgies. So now, why did Aaron do this? The scripture doesn't give us the full answer but we can put some clues together and get a fairly good picture. First, the people's long familiarity with idol worship would incline them to follow that method. The people had not yet received the commandments of God, and so there was no thing against idol worship at that time because Moses had not yet come down with the tablets of the law. Second, they were already in the habit of merging their beliefs with all of the religious pluralism in the communities and the countries around them, the Canaanites, the Egyptians, the Hittites, and so forth. Now, this is a practice of merging pagan understanding with the worship of Yahweh that was to dog the Israelites all during the kingdom period. And third, Aaron faced this unruly crowd. They were afraid. They were impatient and they didn't know what to think or believe. And so the solution of making an idol and calling it by God's name seemed to be fairly reasonable. Now, we might ask, well, why did he choose a calf or a bull? Well, his lame excuse to Moses when Moses came down and found out about it and said, why did you do this? He said, well, it just came out of the fire like that. Of course, we know that that, you know, is a lame excuse because we had already learned that Aaron had taken tools and had taken time to fashion this golden calf and form it that way. A bull was a symbol of strength and fertility. And the people were already familiar with all of the bull gods that were around Egypt. Bulls were also a typical sacrifice at that time. And of course, I have preached several sermons where I have talked about the strength and the importance of a bull sacrifice versus that of a cow, that you would have many, many cows for milk, for butter, for cheese, and also to take for the hide. And you might have one bull with 10 or 15 cows. 
If you sacrifice a cow, you still have plenty left. If you sacrifice a bull, you have lost the progeny that that bull would produce. So it becomes an even greater sacrifice and gift to the gods. Now, the image of a bull as a symbol of God being worshiped was a natural connection. Now, Aaron's bull was a mixture of the powerful God who delivered the people through the mighty works and the pagan methods of worship that were borrowed from the people who were all around the Israelites. Now, it would be easy for me to draw a comparison of the golden calf with um, that huge charging bull, which is right on Wall Street in New York City. It would follow naturally to preach about greed and covetousness and the importance of not putting possessions over people. But I think you've heard that message before. So let me just tell you a story. This is an analogy. Kevin works for a local telecommunications company. And he tells his friends that he loves his job. He loves the company he works for and the benefits they provide. And he loves his boss. But if you were to follow Kevin around for a week, you would notice that something is off. On average, he arrives about 15 minutes late. And he leaves about 15 minutes early every day. Sometimes he takes some of his office supplies home, like when he needs a pen or a highlighter. When he sits at his desk, he has one screen open on his work, and one screen is open to Facebook and to the sports center. He takes an extra long lunch break, and he never stops outside of his cubicle to really talk or to visit or collaborate with any of his coworkers. If you were to ask him, about his job, he would say, oh, absolutely, I love this job. I wouldn't trade it for the world. But secretly, he's on all the job boards, checking around what else is available. Now, this story of Kevin is a parable. It's an analogy for our relationship with God. Let me tell you the story again, but this time, Kevin is a Christian. If you were to talk to Kevin after church, He would say he loves his church, he loves Jesus, and he loves God. But if you were to follow Kevin around for a week, you would notice that something is off. On average, he doesn't pray. And although he owns a Bible, he really couldn't tell you where in the house it is right now. He calls the church he attends his church, but he only goes if something else doesn't pop up that he'd rather do. And when Kevin does attend, he's an audience member. He's not a participant. He doesn't have any friends there at the church. He doesn't volunteer. He's not involved in any of the small groups. He doesn't go to any of the classes or workshops. If you were to ask Kevin if he loves God, he would say, oh, absolutely. And if you ask him if he loved his church, he'd say, oh, yeah. But does he really? You see, Kevin has a problem. His words tell one story. I love God. I love the church. But his actions tell a different story. And that story is there's a lot of other things that are more important to me than my relationship with God or my participation in my church. And idolatry is basically defined as anything that we put above our relationship with God. It's when we put God second. So how do you know if something or someone is an idol for you or not? Observe what happens when you're deprived of it or it's taken away. Oh man, when I preached about pornography a couple of years ago, so many guys called me in that next week who wanted to talk about it. If you believe you cannot live without something, that you would do almost anything, including breaking one of the other Ten Commandments, like lying or cheating or stealing, then it becomes like a god for you. For some people, gambling becomes their god because it makes them feel good and it promises great riches. For others, it can be things like drugs or alcohol 
Again, it makes you feel good, and it gives you a feeling of escape or a feeling of power. And even technology becomes a god and an idol for us. You know, we spend our time, we spend our money, and we spend our attention on our technology. It gives our lives meaning. And if you take away a person's device or cut them off from Wi-Fi, well, what happens? They go through withdrawal. You know, when I was a teenager and I was being punished for something, well, I got grounded. I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't go out with my friends and I couldn't have friends over. I might just have to go and sit in my room. But today, parents punish their kids by taking away their phone or they take away their Xbox or access to video games. The God can devolve into any kind of thing that's like an addiction, whether it's a person, an item, a practice, or a thing. Now for me, confession time, doing work can be my God. I spend my time and I spend my attention doing my work. And of course, it leads me to breaking other commandments, even ironically, the first one of putting something else in the place of God. It's especially difficult for priests and deacons to honor the Sabbath day because leading worship is part of our work. And our work becomes our identity. And we can confuse leading worship on the Sabbath with honoring and keeping the Sabbath holy. This God, this idol, is really a stopgap measure to keep us from having to face our fears and live with the demands and the ambiguities of being God's people. Because here's the secret fear that my addiction to work covers up. Actually, I'm kind of a lazy person. So I overcompensate by working all the time. Work is my golden calf because it makes me feel better about myself. I get my needs that way. So God comes up with an interesting way of getting rid of this false god, this golden calf. Do you remember the story? You know what happens with that false god, with the idol, when Moses comes down and finds out about it? Remember, he's so angry, he throws down those stone tablets and they break. And then he instructs that they grind up the golden calf, not melt it down, break it into pieces and grind it up into a powder, a fine gold powder. And then he has that powder sprinkled on the water and he makes the Israelites drink it. Kind of gross, isn't it? But take it a step further. Stay with me with this. What happened after they consumed that gold? What form did it take as it left their bodies? Yeah, it came out in their excrement. Gives a whole new meaning to the word bullshine, right? But it's actually a very appropriate punishment because it teaches a truth about the futility of worshiping an idol. And that is that it can lead to a stinky mess. Amen. The Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. 
he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people. The response today will be, we pray to you, O Lord. Let us pray. Lord, for those who need to feel you close, who need the assurance of your love, the encouragement of your spirit, we pray to you, O Lord. We pray for those who are persecuted, who are discriminated against, who are mocked because of their faith or the color of their skin or because of who they choose to love. We pray to you, O Lord. We pray for those who are imprisoned, who are tortured, who are exiled, especially those who have struggled and spoken out for the rights of their people. We pray to you, O Lord. And we pray for those who are having financial difficulties because of loss of employment, for those struggling to pay bills, and for those who are having trouble being isolated and feeling alone, for those who are warned, worried about getting sick, and for those who are worried about their families. We pray to you, O Lord. We pray for those caught up in racism and hatred, for the disproportionate number of blacks and people of color who have contracted the virus and died. We pray to you, O Lord. We pray for those who are feeling fed up, who are in discomfort, and for those who are afraid. We pray to you, O Lord. Be with us all, Lord, in all our daily struggles as we seek to follow you in our periods of doubt and despair, and in our times of happiness, health, and loving. Be with us all, Lord, until that time when in your kingdom of love, our joy will know no end. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the peace of the Lord be always with you all. Yes, the peace of the Lord be always with you. We're so glad that you have just joined us this morning here at the Church of St. Bernard for our virtual worship. One of the questions that's on everybody's mind, I can't get away with it, Anywhere I go, whether I'm in the community or I'm here at the monastery or even in my own condo, people are asking me, when is the monastery going to be open again for in-person worship? That's certainly the question of the day. I can tell you that our vestry, which is the church's board of directors, met this last Tuesday and began and had begun to discuss reopening plans. What I can tell you at this point is that it's likely that after the presidential election, November 3rd, our vestry and some key lay leaders will probably be meeting for some small in-person services, just the vestry alone, where we can have a chance to scope out social distancing, where we can deal with the problems of masks and how we can keep everyone safe and what spaces we will use and how we will have to arrange seating and so forth. After the vestry has struggled with that and are able to come up with some concrete ideas, we will submit those to our bishop and diocesan leaders as an official plan and ask for them to give us their permission for us to implement that plan. So we're still many weeks off, but what I can tell you is that we will be announcing it well in advance, several weeks, so that you can begin to make plans. 
as other Episcopal churches around us are also in the same position of deciding when they are going to open, um, whether that's at the end of October or sometime in November, they're also struggling with the issue of how do you limit people who can come? Because one thing is for sure, we're not going to be able to open up three services and have 150 or 175 people sitting in our chapel. That's not gonna happen. So we're gonna to need to limit the number of people and also decide which spaces we'll use, whether outside the loggia garden, whether we'll be in our prayer well area, uh, which is called a garth, it's that center courtyard, and where we'll do seatings. Some churches are using a lottery system. They'll just draw names and those people will be the ones who can come to the first service, the second service as well. Other churches are implementing sort of an alphabetical system. If your name is last name begins with A through F, you come at this time. If it's G through M, you come at this time. And still there are other churches that are doing sort of like reservations, like you might call in for a restaurant. We're not sure what is best gonna fit us and how our vestry and key leaders are gonna implement that. Because as your elected leaders of the church, they will be the ones to help put this into place and to make it fair and equitable for everybody. So we're struggling with those things right now. Now I wanna remind you that just because our services are not open to the public, that doesn't mean that ministry or that caring has stopped. Mother Anne is still doing a healing Eucharist every Thursday at 12 noon. It's a short service. It's only about 25 minutes in length, and it is particularly a time of prayer to pray for those not only in our own parish and extended families, but also those in our community and our sinful and broken world. If you'd like to be a part of that ministry, there is a link that was sent along with this one for YouTube and Facebook. You just scroll down and find it. You can also send us a message through our website, www.spanishmonastery.com, or of course, to telephone the church and get more information. If you're watching on um, Facebook this morning, down in the chat, uh, Gretchen Abidar is our chat monitor, and she'll be able to send you that information as well so you can join us on Thursday. Our Community of Hope continues to pray for all who are sick and shut in, as does our Daughters of the King. So if we have ways that we can pray for you and those that you care about, please let us know by using one of those methods of social media to contact us so that we can include your prayer request in our time of prayer. Now, my last announcement is to let you know that next week, which is Sunday, October 18th, we will not be broadcasting on Facebook and YouTube. Our diocese will be celebrating our 50th anniversary as the Diocese of Southeast Florida. And our bishop and diocesan leaders are inviting everybody to participate in one unit where we are all together from way up north in Stewart all the way to Key West and out to the, uh, to the Glades. So we hope you'll want to tune in at 10 a.m. next week. If you receive a regular link to hook up with us on YouTube or Facebook, you'll get that same information. Again, it will be posted on our website and on our social media um, like Instagram for you to get that information. Our guest preacher will be our presiding bishop, Michael Curry. This was planned some years ago before anyone ever dreamed that we would have the quarantines and the isolation that the COVID crisis has brought us. The presiding bishop accepted an invitation from our bishop, Bishop Peter Eaton, to come and celebrate with us on our 50th anniversary. And the presiding bishop, although he will not be with us here in person, will be our preacher uh, through the magic of the internet uh, with a taped sermon for that. So you won't want to miss that. Our bishop will be the principal celebrate, celebrant in our cathedral church, Trinity Downtown, and we hope all of you and, yea, verily, all of the Episcopal churches in our diocese will want to join in at 10 a.m. next Sunday morning. And then we'll resume our regular services for the Sundays after that at 11. Let us walk in love as Christ has loved us and gave himself up an offering and a sacrifice unto God. Hi, I'm Brother Angel Gabriel. Lilith McDonald. Deacon Charles. Mother Ann. 
Bob Burgess, Senior Warden. Barbara Harris. Diego Vizaga. I'm Brother Tommy. And I'm your rector, Gregory Mansfield, and we're your delegation from St. Bernard de Claveaux to Diocesan Convention this weekend. We're proud to represent this parish and you. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that this my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Father, the Almighty. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at my hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and a joyful thing everywhere and always to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to the glory of your name. We gather this day as one people, members of the same body, and grateful, O oh God, for your many gifts, carrying the hope within us for a world that will be filled with love. This vision was given by you from the very beginning of your creation. 
You made the earth and all that lives on it. You inspired prophets and shepherds, widowed and those who were enslaved to seek liberation from all that oppresses so that we might be released to love fully. You became incarnate in Jesus Christ so that through him we might experience the depth and the width of your unquenchable love. While Jesus lived among us, he stood up for women and children. He touched the untouchable, healed the sick, and welcomed those who had given up hope of ever being included. Through him we see a path not only to our own freedom, but a path to liberation of the whole world. He taught us that it will not be in the brutality of violence that our world will be saved. Rather, it will be in showing kindness to our neighbor, in standing up against injustice, in returning hate with love, in transforming one heart at a time. It will be the simple but holy task of dining together, sharing bread and wine, and truly seeing one another as beloved by you. We know this because of the night before he suffered and died, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to his friends, saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in memory of me. After dinner, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks and gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new promise, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this to remember me. Send your Holy Spirit, we pray, into these gifts of bread and wine. And please send your Holy Spirit into us, that we may recognize each other as members of the same body, Christ's hands and feet and heart, sent for the healing of the world. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are we who are called to the banquet of the Lamb. Señor, no soy digno. No soy digno. No soy digno. The prayer of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. As though you have already come, I embrace you and unite myself entirely to you. Never permit me to separate from you. Amen. La oración de comunión espiritual. Jesús mío, creo que estás verdaderamente presente en el sagrado sacramento del altar. Te amo encima de todas las cosas y te anhelo en mi alma. Como ahora no te puedo recibir sacramentalmente, entra al menos espiritualmente en mi corazón. Como si ya hubieras venido, te abrazo y me uno completamente a ti. Nunca permitas que me separe de ti. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food and the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. And now may the Lord Jesus, Son of the living God, teach you to walk in his way more trustfully, to accept his truth more faithfully, and to share his life more lovingly, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may come as one family into the kingdom of God. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, remain with you and those you love this day and always. Amen.
The Mass is now ended. So now let us all go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And please remember to use your mask at all times when you're out, when you're shopping, when you're with your loved ones. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.